so last time we defined the partition function z of gamma which depends on a function h so uh, let's see if this works uh, yes so this is the partition function and we introduce a rescaling gamma of the of the of the function h okay uh, which made the theory invariant, uh, so which leaves the partition function leaves the partition function invariant, and uh, and now we want to calculate z of gamma when gamma goes to infinity. Okay, this is what we want to do, and the reason is that uh, the region where gamma goes to infinity is the region where we can use saddle point methods. Okay. Okay. Very good. So, uh, so why gamma going to infinity is easy? Well, gamma going to infinity is easy because we have such a factor in the partition function, uh, in the integral for the partition function. Now, this is an exponential. And uh, when gamma is very large, uh, gamma squared is large and positive. Mm, and then uh, this exponential will be very peaked. Uh, around the zeros of this function right because you see you have uh, this function here every time if if h prime is different from zero you no know, this will be a, a gaussian which is very much uh, 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 suppressed because gamma is very very large and only when h prime x uh, uh, the exponential is suppressed Um, if h prime of x is equal to zero, mm, uh, there is no suppression of the of the Gaussian. So if you plug, uh, if you plot this function as a function of x, you will see that if if x is a zero of x prime, so if h of h prime of x is h prime of x that is zero sorry you will have something like this you will have something very suppressed that you know for say a large gamma which suddenly becomes not suppressed anymore okay and this is and this is the value one okay so this is the aspect of this function and you can see that as you increase uh, gamma this is more and more picked around this function here now there is a kind of formal way of understanding this, which is to uh, to use this, you know, to use this uh, property, which is uh, tells you that the limit of Gaussian, when properly scaled, uh, actually has this kind of peak behavior, which is delta function, a Dirac delta function. So, so more formally, you have something like this. Which is that this is a delta of x. Okay, so so here notice that um, uh, the the Gaussian can never get larger than one. And this is what I show here. But uh, if you multiply by gamma, then it will be zero everywhere except here, where it will tend to infinity. And this is exactly the definition of delta. And you can see that you know this factor here it's is such that the integral over r of delta x of the x is equal to one. Uh, this is the normalization which fixes this property. So, so this is uh, one of the possible definitions of the delta function as a limit of, uh, of, 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 of a function. Okay? Remember that the delta function is a distribution, but it can be constructed as a, as a limit of uh, ordinary function. Now, in our case, uh, as I said, we don't have uh, this Gaussian. We have this Gaussian here. So what we get is that the limit when gamma goes to infinity, okay, actually I'm going to write, okay, yeah, I, I also can write it like this, of e to the minus one half gamma square h prime of x, this is delta of h prime of x. And delta of a function is something that you know very well. Uh, well, I hope you know, uh, but uh, there is this formula which says that the delta of a function f of x 
is concentrated on the zeros of this function, which is uh, so. So it's a sum of deltas supported on the on the zeros, and then you have um overall factor which is one of the modulus of the prime of x scale okay so this is a standard formula in the theory of distributions which i hope you have seen at some point in your life and this is what i'm going to use so if i use this i it follows that delta prime of h of x is equal to the sum of xk which are zeros uh, so these are the zeros of of this derivative which by the way are the critical points of the function h huh? so here we are summing over critical points and then i have one over the second derivative of x evaluated at k at the zeros times delta of x minus x k okay so this is the basic uh, this is the basic identity i'm going to use um and this is uh, this is actually very important because there is the content of this localization theory of this localization result so remember that uh, we are computing uh, we are computing this integral and precisely because the theory is supersymmetric it doesn't uh, uh, depend on the value of gamma okay so it can change gamma as we wish and uh, and the main uh, and, and the main uh, point of, uh, of of this construction is precisely to to evaluate uh, gamma when gamma is very large because this is where we expect the theory to be simple. And where is going to this theory to be very simple? Well, this theory is going to be very simple um, when gamma goes to infinity because we will actually localize this integral in the zeros of this function. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this these zeros correspond to what in classical mechanics would be the classical solution to the equations of motion because this is the these are the points uh, where the saddle point uh, uh, approximation uh, which uh, would be the points that would be selected by the saddle point approximation okay let me make an operation in order because I think that I'm running out of battery also in the second okay. <laughs> That's better. Okay. Uh, so, so this is what uh, we are going to use. And then uh, we are going to write the integral uh, again. So, z of gamma is the integral of uh, dx d theta. And then I have this. And then I have uh, also uh, gamma theta one theta two h two of x if I remember correctly. So now, in order to evaluate this uh, when gamma is very large, I can use this formula for the delta function. So, uh, so in the limit, you know, as gamma goes to infinity, I can replace this factor here. So the integrals remain. I can replace this factor here, but a square root of two pi divided by gamma. And then I will have here the sum over xk of one over x second of xk delta of x minus xk. And this is coming from this, okay? And also the prefactor. And then I will have this factor here. But once I have the delta function, this integral is trivial to evaluate. So I will get the square root of 2 pi over gamma, uh, sum over x case. And then, you know, I have here uh, actually, I can write this in as let me just write this, uh, write this before. And then I have the integral over theta over x, and then I have the deltas. But of course, 
the delta function is the simpler function to integrate, right? So I can do this integral immediately, and then I get this sum of xk, one over h second of xk. The, the integral over x is trivial, and then I get this thing here. And now this function is already localized into these points xk. Okay. So this is a trivial Gassman integral. Mm -hmm. And notice that uh, here I will get a gamma. Uh, so the gamma here will cancel this gamma. And then I get sum of h second of xk divided by h second of xk. And actually the factor of the square root of two pi I should have included from the very beginning because it was hitting my definition of the integral. So I think I, I, I dropped it at some point, but uh, this would be here. So actually I should have here this, this factor. I mean, this is just for convenience. Huh? This is just to have something nicer. But uh, once I do this, this factor is no longer here. No longer here, no longer here, and no longer here. And here I am. And this is my final result. So this is that of gamma. This is this is the value of the partition function. Okay. So this is a strange formula, right? For this integral. It just says that z is a sum over all the critical points of h of x. And at each critical point, you have to evaluate this quotient. You have to take the second derivative of this function and divide by this modulo. So this is a sum of plus and minus ones, OK? And the value of this function depends on this sum, OK? So uh, let me actually explain how you evaluate this in the simplest case in which h prime of x is a polynomial. Okay. And you will see you will see many interesting things that actually will reappear later on when we discuss the Witten index in supersymmetric quantum mechanics. This is a very beautiful example. It's the play, it displays all the complexities of, of, of more complicated, I mean, all the character, characteristic features of more complicated examples. So if h, prime is a, if h prime of x is a polynomial, you have two possibilities. Either h prime of x has a odd degree, so is the form a to m plus one, x to m plus one plus, Something sub sorry, not of degree. Sorry, this is not. Uh, I'm, I'm not explaining this uh, correctly. This doesn't mean that it is of degree. This means that the is of the form. So just let me say is of the form. So either the highest non-zero power of h prime of x is odd, or is even, right? This doesn't mean that the, that the function is, 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 is even off. It's just that you look to the highest non-zero term mm, uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the term which has the highest degree in this function, in this polynomial, okay? Now let's suppose that h prime of x is of this form, okay? It's, 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 it has a higher degree which is odd. So the function will be of this form, something like this. Okay. So this is h prime of x. Or it could be the other way around. Uh, it's, it, also could, it could also be, depending on the sign, here you could have also something like this. Okay. But if you have this form, now you see uh, the, the evaluation of gamma tells you that you should look at the zeros of this function. So the zeros are this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And now you have to associate signs 
by calculating the uh, absolute value, so the, the sign of the slope of the function at this point. So here we have a plus one, here we have minus one, here we have plus one, here we have minus one, and here we have a uh, plus one, sorry, or the other way around. Sorry, this is the other way around. Uh, so this is minus one. Yeah, so this is a this is like negative slope. This is positive. This is negative. So this is negative, positive, and negative. Okay, and here we have um, here we have this is a plus one minus one plus one minus one plus one so you see that these things come in pairs okay uh because uh because this function is such that uh you know the zeros alternate here uh, and they come in pairs of minus one plus one minus one plus one minus one for this question so here z is going to be minus one and here is going to be plus one and a very interesting thing happens. Imagine that I deform this polynomial. So I deform it in such a way that I keep this property at the highest power of the highest degree of the polynomial, of the highest uh, power appearing in the polynomial is the same. And I do not change the sign of, the, uh, of, this, of this leading term. So I could, for example, deform this function by 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 doing something like this right this is a deformation of this polynomial of this function h prime of x uh, this is a deformation in which i keep this property that the highest uh, power of this polynomial is still odd and has the same sign. So you see that these two zeros, these uh, four zeros have disappeared. Okay. So now we only have this zero here. But since they disappear in pairs, plus or minus one, the value of z doesn't change. The value of z here is still z equal to plus one. Okay. So you see that uh, the, the partition function, oh, sorry. The partition function is uh, is actually invariant under these uh, under these operations, mm, under the formations, as long as they do not change the behavior of this function at infinity. Mm. And you see that the z is a sum over over points, and under the formation, these points appear or disappear in pairs in such a way that the value of z is not changed. And this is the core of, of topological invariance because it means that under a small deformations which do not change you want the topology of this function, the value of z is not going to change because things appear or disappear in such a way uh, that uh, um, that um, that uh, they do not contribute to the they do not change the value of the partition function. So. Uh, so this is what happens when z is 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 odd when h bar of x is odd. Now when h uh, when h bar of x is is has an even term uh, is uh, the highest degree of let me say it precisely the highest degree of h prime of x is even, then you will find a function like this, and then you will see that uh, very clearly that uh, now now we have these uh, points coming exactly in pairs so that uh, that is zero okay and again if you deform this function so so you deform it like this it still set is going to be zero okay because again things appear and disappear in pairs so this is the value there so if h if h prime of x is a polynomial, we deduce that the partition function is 
zero if h prime of x is of the form e to n s to the two n and sine of a to n plus one if h prime of x is a to n plus one x to n plus one. Okay. So uh, remember that uh, you know here the value of z depends on the on the structure of the of on on the sign of the of this function. This is now an, a, a function whose highest degree is an odd polynomial, so it's going to go to mm, it's going to have this shape. So this is when a to m plus one is negative, and this is when a to m plus one is positive. Okay. So this is uh, this is precisely this is the, the this is the final evaluation of the partition function, um, and, and 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 this makes even more precise in which sense this partition function is independent of the formations of H. Well, notice that the actual deformation that we use in order to do this calculation was invariance of Z and the rescalings of H, and it's clear that rescalings of H are leave the function completely invariant. Now. One has to be careful because, of course, when we when we were studying this this uh, when we were studying the invariance over Z, we studied two types of invariance. We studied invariance under small deformations and under scalings. Okay. So these are the these are invariances. Of, these are the invariances of Z. But not, we cannot really um, we cannot really uh, change H arbitrarily. I mean, that is still depends on H in some way. So what are the deformations of, of H that actually change the value of Z? Well, the deformations are the ones which have the highest, uh, uh, highest degree, the, the coefficient of the highest degree term in this polynomial. If we change H in such a way that the highest, uh, uh, the, the, the coefficient of the highest degree becomes zero or changes sign, then, you know, we will change that, okay? So, but these are not uh, small deformations. These are large deformations, in a sense. And you can actually see that if you do such a radical deformation of H, then this Z is not going to be zero. It's going to be different. The, the, the variation of Z under this radical deformation is going to be different from zero. So, so again, remember when I was when I was explaining you the invariance of Z under deformations, I told you that you should be careful because. Uh, Sometimes there could be boundary effects that make this variation different from zero. And now, once you have the result here, you, have, you realize that you should have been careful, but because if you do the formations of H, which are too large in a sense, and they affect the behavior of the function at infinity, then you will change the, the, the value of that. But for example, rescalings of H leave com the function completely invariant. Okay, because rescaling a function doesn't change its behavior at infinity as long as gamma is uh, is uh, is positive. Okay, so uh, so this is one of the things that uh, this is one of the aspects that uh, that you know we we can make more precise uh, uh, once we have the answer. Okay, so are there questions at this point? I mean, this is one of the most important uh, results that we will get. Okay, and this is essentially the model for all calculations that we will do. Uh, now, uh, so so just let me just make two comments. So the first comment is that this this is localization of the integral. It's a very important principle. All contributions to this integral come from the critical points of H. Okay, this special point. Any other point is not going to give any contribution to the integral. Now, the second comment is on the lo how you get the localization locus. So the points, so how do you guess what are the points that contribute?
Um, uh, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to, to, to give you, uh, I mean, not really an argument. I'm going to make an observation which can be made into an argument, uh, which is the following. Now, remember that, uh, so remember that, uh, that in, in our transformations, we have, uh, we have these transformations for, uh, and just remind you the transformations of the, of the graph on fields. Mm, okay, I think uh, this is the only things that the only ones that we know we need. Okay. Uh, and now D is a field that didn't appear in in a Gaussian integral. So essentially, we did this integral here. Okay. And when you, uh, when you do this integral, essentially, you, you complete the square of this, uh, of this Gaussian. I have to write it like this. Right, uh, minus one half. Okay. So you can see that uh, in this integral, you this is a Gaussian peaked around the e is equal to minus i h prime of x. And, and then you do this integral and you get, uh, when you do this integral, you get the square root of pi e to the minus one half h prime of x squared. This is the form of the integral that we use in our calculations. So, uh, so an auxiliary field has property that uh, you can eliminate it, you can eliminate it. By setting it to a given value. And this is the value around which it is picked in the Gaussian integral. So D is equal to minus i h prime. Y. Another way to see this is that this is the value that you would get if you thought about this as some sort of uh, action, okay? So if you think about this action, which uh, I wrote before, so this is the action of the theory, the, the, the bosonic part, this is the only one where D intervenes. So uh, D H prime of X. Then you see that if I do, if I thought, if I think about X as a function of D, it's a stream point of them by making a variation. So D equal to minus I H prime of X is the a, a value which extremizes the action, which extremizes the action. Okay, so so auxiliary fields have this property that uh, that uh, can be eliminated by a Gaussian integration. The Gaussian is picked certain value. Okay. I, I hope I mean I'm not sure that everybody understands what I say because sometimes I probably use a language which is uh, so familiar. So if you have questions, please ask me. Okay, so. So when I mean that this peak means that this, this is a, a function, this is a Gaussian in which, uh, you know, this is D zero, okay? And this is D minus D zero. So this is, okay, D zero here is imaginary, but this is not important for, for, for our purposes. So we 
can think about this still as, as, as a Gaussian which is picker on this value. Another way of thinking about this is that uh, this is uh, the value of D that you obtain when you uh, think about the action as an action in, in field theory in which or in, in mechanics in which you extremize its values. Okay? So we are in zero dimension here there are no derivatives. Uh, so you know this is just an algebraic equation and this is the equation that you find for D. So if you extremize the action with respect to D, this is the value that you take. So, so as I said, uh, an auxiliary value you can eliminate it by setting it to a given value, and this is actually what we did. Huh? This is actually exactly what we did in, in our in our context because we eliminated this. You know, when, when we computed Z of gamma, we really didn't uh, we really didn't uh, look at uh, uh, at the action depending on D. I mean, we just integrated uh, uh, this Gaussian integration in order to eliminate it. Now, but you see, the transformations of theta 1 and theta 2 depends on D. Now, what happens after you eliminate D? Well, as I said, the only thing you have to do is to set D to its value. So if you set D to this value, you can see that now the transformations become H prime of X epsilon 2 and D theta 2, it's H prime minus H prime of X epsilon 1. Okay. So you can actually, you can check that the theory without D or the theory in which you have set D to its value, it's invariant under this supersymmetric transformation. So uh, more precisely what I mean is that this action, which now depends only on X and theta, which is uh, one half of h prime square uh, minus theta one, theta two, h two of x. This action is involved under the supersymmetries once I set d to its value and then the supersymmetries now involve h prime of x, okay? So this action is invariant under delta one, delta two, with D replaced by minus I H prime, okay? And actually, if you look at the book by Buff and Saslo and on mirror symmetry where this example is discussed, they use already this version of the theory in which the field D has been eliminated, okay? So, uh, for those of you who will eventually read papers uh, on, on, on the physics of this, uh, setting D to its, to its uh, extremizing value is called going on shell in the physics literature. So this means uh, that on shell means that you know uh, things are according to the classical to the value uh, dictated by the classical theory and so these supersymmetric transformations in which d has been set to its value are called on shell transformations while the transformations that we started with involving the d function sometimes called off shell Okay. The question? Yes. So, so this looks like it combines somehow classical and quantum thing, things that we just look at the classical equation of motion. Yes. Yes. But but, but this is, but this you can do it for auxiliary fields because that's why this field is special because okay. it only enters in the theory in, in as a, in, in a Gaussian dependence. Okay. So this this is exactly because it's in we are integrating away a Gaussian. If there was something other than exactly, exactly. I mean, the the the, the, the main import, the main property of D is that the dependence on the theory is purely Gaussian. So you can this part of the theory is in a sense trivial. You see, X is not an auxiliary field because the dependence of the theory on X mm -hmm. is not Gaussian because H could be very complicated, right? Could be an arbitrary function. So this only holds 
for this is and this is what actually characterizes an oxidative field. An oxidative field is characterized by two properties. In a dynamical theory, it's characterized by the fact that it doesn't. Uh, it uh, uh, first of all, uh, it is characterized by the fact that the action is Gaussian, involving the field is Gaussian, so it's just at most quadratic in this field, and moreover, it doesn't involve derivatives. Okay. Now mm -hmm. here we are working at zero dimensions, so the, uh, the there are no derivatives acting on the field. I mean, the, there is no there is no this is a field which is a field in zero dimension, so it doesn't depend on any coordinate of space time, right? Mm -hmm. But in an actual physical theory where there is where there are dimensions, an auxiliary field is uh, doesn't uh, doesn't enter uh, the dependence on the action, and it doesn't involve its derivatives. So it's purely algebraic. So for these special fields, you can always do this trick of doing the Gaussian integral and set and this sets them to their to a classical value okay because mm -hmm. okay doing the integral and extremizing with respect to it uh, uh, it's uh, it's equivalent so you are absolutely right that here I'm mixing so I doing something classical but I'm allowed to do this precisely because D is auxiliary and it only enters in in, in the theory in a Gaussian way okay okay thanks. okay so that thanks for the question because this is an important clarification. <clears throat> now, um, okay. So now let's look at transformations of the fields on shell after eliminating D, and you can see that something very special happens precisely when X has a critical point. So at the critical point. Are the critical points of H prime of H, sorry. Are the critical points of H delta T1 is equal to delta T2 is equal to zero in the on shell version. Okay. <clears throat> so so the points XK are fixed points. In the sense of group C of the supersymmetry transformations. <clears throat> so that's a very interesting, that's a very interesting property of these points. So the points where you localize the integral are precisely the fixed points of this fermionic symmetry. And this is this, uh, if you have a study, uh, uh, you know, fixed point theorems in, in topology or in geometry or in, uh, then you, you, rem uh, you, you, there are situations in which you can localize um, integrals of forms in geometry when there is an, a, an action of, of a group, of an abelian group acting on your manifold. So you have a manifold acted by a U1 symmetry. Mm -hmm. You can sometimes localize integrals to the fixed points of the of to the fixed points of this U1 symmetry. And these are these are these uh, well known. Uh, this is the Atiya bot uh, fixed point theorems. And so on, right? So here, uh, so, so these are things that you know. You, you just uh, study, say, uh, equivalent cohomology theories. You you know, this is a fundamental result that you can localize integrals of uh, equivalent differential forms to the fixed points of an U1 action, and so on. But what we are doing here is some sort of super space version of these results because we have an action on our space, which is the supersymmetry. And this action has fixed points. Uh, uh, these are um, points where the, act, the, the, the coordinates do not change. Mm -hmm. And precisely uh, these, uh, these uh, fixed points of these supersymmetry transformations are the ones are, uh, in which the integral will localize. So this is very, very similar to what happens in, 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 in geometry. So in this case, 
uh, the integrals can be evaluated by localization on the fixed points of the one symmetry. And here, the integral can be evaluated by localization at the fixed points of the supersymmetry transformation. So, uh, this is really a very nice analogy. Um, and this also, in practical terms, is very useful because if I give you a theory and I wrote and write for you the supersymmetry transformations that this theory satisfies, you can already, uh, by looking at the fixed points of the on shell version of the supersymmetry transformations, you can already guess what are going to be the points where the theory localizes. Okay? And this is a very, very useful observation. Okay? So if I give you, so, so this means that if I give you a supersymmetric theory, uh, you are going to be able to see where the path integral, where the integral over configurations localizes just by looking at the supersymmetric transformation without doing anything else. Now, then it happens that if you do a careful analysis by understanding, you know, how the theory is invariant under the formations, you will eventually reach the same conclusion. But just by looking at the fixed points, you can already guess what are going to be the points where the integral localizes. Okay, so that's a very, that's a very nice observation, which I, it's, uh, it's really useful in, in applications. Okay. So if you don't mind, uh, uh, we are going to do now some, uh, uh, we are going to do the break uh, of uh, 10 minutes to compensate for the five minutes that we missed uh, by, because of my technical problems, sorry. So uh, are there any questions on what we ha I have explained? I think the, this example, as I, as I said, is very simple, but it's going to set the pattern for the whole course. I don't know how far we're going to get in this course, but uh, everything will be a variation in a sense on this, uh, on this example. So many of the things that we're going to do in this course are going to be really uh, variations of this very simple um, principle. Okay. Any question? Comments? Well, maybe I have a question. Uh, yes. How, uh, I'm not really understanding how should we understand this uh, transformation in infinitesimal form? How, how can we construct like the real transformation from this infinitesimal form? Oh, I see. You want to integrate the infinitesimal supersymmetry transformation? Yeah, just uh, how to do this, like maybe abstract view. Well, I guess you should... Uh, you should uh, work in super space and try to exponentiate this. Uh, this is like a, that the algebra of the transformation, you should try to exponentiate this right, uh, in super space. I have never done this, but I guess you can do it. And I guess some people have done it. I can look to, I mean, maybe I can look to reference on this. Um, I mean, I don't think it's that useful in order to understand the dynamics of the theory. Because in contrast to Lie algebra to Lie group theory, where I'm exponentiating the Lie algebra is useful to reconstruct uh, the action, in supersymmetric theories, uh, it's not so useful to actually have the action of the uh, group and not of the algebra. But in principle, you could try to exponentiate this, this, uh, these uh, transformations in super space and generate the whole, uh, the whole transformation. But as I said, I, I, I mean, in, in my whole life, I have never seen this done. Uh, probably because it doesn't give you much, uh, unless you want to develop the abstract theory of super uh, groups associated to supersymmetry transformation. But, uh, but, but the, yeah. What is the right way to understand that the, like, the delta of X is dependent on uh, Grassmann variables? Like, how to understand this, how to exponentiate such types of equations? Well, you know, once you have both uh, commuting and anti-commuting variables, uh, you can think about a transformation that mixes both of them, right? That's the, that's the whole idea of supersymmetry. That's why it's not a trivial idea. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, just, it's, just, uh, it's, it's, it's just an extension of the idea that... Uh, that general transformations mix the coordinates and somehow you have commuting and anti-commuting coordinates and you mix them both, right? So that's, uh, <coughs> that's, how, uh, that's how supersymmetry appeared. Uh, in, in quantum field theory, or in, you think about it as a transformation that mixes both bosonic and fermionic degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you think about the transformations, the groups that act on quantum fields, you know, usually they only, they do not mix uh, 
bosons with fermions. You have, for example, you know, the Lorentz group acts on bosons and you know, mixes bosons with bosons and adds on fermions and mixes fermions with fermions, but doesn't mix uh, bosons with fermions. Now, you extend this in a way in which you mix both things, and this is what makes this, super, this transformation so special. But it's an abstract, uh, it's an abstract uh, step. I mean, uh, you see, that's the power of mathematics, that you not always have an intuitive version of it. Uh, you, you, you think by analogy, by heuristic reasoning, and then you decide that you want to do a, a rotation of X, which is not going to make, uh, you know, it's not going to be a, a commuting variable, it's going to be an anti-commuting variable. And then, you know, you think about this idea, and then, you know, it turns out to be, uh, uh, and this, this, this actually works mathematically. Now, if you are w looking for an intuitive explanation, then, you know, then I, I, you know, maybe there isn't an intuitive explanation in the sense that this is clearly not a standard transformation. I don't know if this answers your question uh, of what is the meaning of this. Because, uh, yeah, maybe. These questions are always very subjective, I guess. And, you know, uh, Marcos, can I make a comment on this? Yes. Um, from the point of view of, 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 of physics? Yes. So, is the concept of being uh, big and small well defined for uh, Grassmann variables at all? No, 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 no. That's actually because, not the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because no. I think that's the confusion when you have the linear transformation and there's a Grassmann variable there. I would expect there to be a small parameter, but there's just a Grassmann generator. So I don't know yeah, if yeah, there's yeah. a small transformation or what is it? No, no, no. That's absolutely true. So, Actually, if you exponentiate this, you will see that, you know, you get, remember, functions of uh, Grassmann variables, exponentials of Grassmann variables get truncated, okay? So, in a sense, generating the Lie algebra of these transformations, the Lie group of these transformations is simple. But, um, but um, yeah, but you see, the fact that it's clear that Grassmann algebras follow a different logic than, than commuting variables. But the point would you, is precisely to kind of exploit this and see where you get. Mm -hmm. I think that's... Uh, awesome. I, I have to say also that, you know, if you integrate overall Grassmann variables, so you take a supersymmetric theory, you take this function z, okay? So maybe, uh, I don't know if I can start sharing my screen here. Uh, okay, do you see my screen now? Not at the moment. No, you don't see it anymore, right? No. Okay, well, so I will have to, for some reason. So, uh, mm. Just one second. So maybe now you will see it. Uh... Mm. No, it's not working now. So anyway, I will try to solve this later on, and then I will comment on this. But. I mean, a supersymmetric, what I wanted to say is that a supersymmetric theory, once you integrate over all Grassmann variables, is a bosonic theory. But this is a bosonic theory, which is very specific, and this is what we want to exploit here, right? I mean, it's a very special type of bosonic theory once you have integrated over all Grassmann variables. So you can, in principle, do it. Yeah? And, and uh, so, so you can always reduce a theory with Grassmann variables to a theory without Grassmann variables. But this theory without Grassmann variables is very special. And this is uh, what is important. In a sense, you can think about it as, as you can think about supersymmetric theory as a very special type of bosonic theory. Okay? So I will try to explain this once I make, I'm able to make my path to work in, again. Okay? Okay, okay so let's, uh, let's pause this and, and then, you know, recording. So I will start then with uh, supersymmetry and geometry. Okay? So, so the, the, the basic idea is to use these uh, supersymmetric constructions to actually generate invariants of manifolds and bundles. And the reason one could actually do this is precisely the example you have seen. You know, in this example, we have seen that you have these supersymmetric theories. Uh, they actually characterize uh, functions uh, in a sort of invariant way. Yeah? The, 
the, the partition function that we're introducing our example was uh, calculating the behavior of functions in a sense at infinity, characterizing the behavior of, of functions at infinity in a sense. It was characterizing how these functions go to infinity uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the configuration space. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so now we're going to really do something very specific to geometry. So uh, I'm going to start with X, which is an orientable compact and dimensional manifold, differentiable manifold. Uh, I'm going to consider a vector van der Van X. vector bundle of even rank so to m which is going to be smaller or equal than n and you if you know very often you want to characterize uh, these uh, vector bundles topologically and one of the most important characteristics of a vector bundle is its Euler characteristic which is invariant under the geomorphism of the vector bundle. Uh, this is usually calculated as an integral over M of uh, the Euler class uh, of the bundle. Huh? So here, actually, I'm going to assume that uh, to M is equal to N. Okay. So here, this assumes that to M is equal to N because this Euler characteristic of the bundle. It's a cohomology class of degree to m. Okay, so in, in general, you can always calculate this uh, this uh, characteristic class of the bundle, and if the this uh, 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 which has degree to m, and if the degree to m is is top degree, you can integrate it and produce a number. Okay, and in particular, if m is an even dimensional manifold so that uh, n is equal to 2m then one particular bundle which is very important is of course the tangent bundle mm, of, uh, of, of our manifold and in this case k of tm is the Euler characteristic of the manifold itself okay So this is uh, one of the most uh, classical uh, topological invariants of a manifold, which is actually the topological invariant of a vector bundle over the manifold, which is the tangent bundle, okay? Now, how do you calculate these quantities? Well, it turns out that uh, uh, one way to calculate these quantities is to use non-invariant, I mean, this, this, this invariant, uh, this, is, this is a topological invariant, so it, 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 it it characterizes the manifold or the bundle topologically. But very often, in order to calculate these quantities, we use non-invariant information. So th we use things which are not topological, but we try to extract topological information out of this thing. Okay? And there are two ways, two typical ways of doing this. Of doing this, of using non topological information to extract topological information. One is to use metrics. And this is churn by theory. And the other is use sections of the bundle. And this is poincare hop theory. So you see, uh, these are two ways. I mean, neither metrics nor sections are invariant. I mean, you know, there are many metrics that you can use, and there are many sections you can use. But the question is how to extract topological information out of this non-topological information. And this is one of the. This is really a classical problem in topology. And uh, we are going to actually rephrase this problem in terms of uh, supersymmetric theories. So let's start with Chernobyl theory, okay.
Okay. So in order to do this, I'm going to introduce a metric in the bundle. So let me remind you some ingredients of this. Let me just uh, pause a second to remind you some of these ingredients and actually to remind them myself because it's not every day that I work with these things. So, um, mm -hmm. So let me start with this. So this is, uh, so the metric, huh? so I want to denote the metric by G and I also going to use a connection on E compatible with the metric, okay. Now, uh, let me remind you that, uh, so let, let, uh, let's, in order to, to make this more precise, Let's introduce the space of, so gamma here of epsilon is the space of smooth sections. S which go from M to E, okay. And a connection is a map from the space of smooth sections to the space of smooth sections times the quotient model of M, okay, uh, satisfying the Leibniz rule. So this means that uh, if F is a smooth function on M, then delta, you can now, if you have a section sigma you can consider a section s times f okay and then this section the connection on this section satisfies this uh, rule that uh, this is the uh, connect this is the connection of sigma times f plus sigma which the f okay so this is uh, this is the defining property of a connection and we also want the connection to be compatible with the metric. So the connection should be compatible with the metric. Okay, so this is a vector bundle. So, you know, the met, oops. Ah, what did I do? I don't know what I do, but uh, it looks like I erase everything. So anyway, so let's continue writing. So so metric is compatible with oops. So the metric is compatible with the connection. So this means that uh, D of G of sigma tau is equal to uh, G of delta S tau plus G of S gamma tau. So this, uh, this I mean, all this information is for those of you who, have, uh, who are very attached to mathematics. Um, for many of you, including myself, it's much easier to do everything in coordinates, which is what you do, uh, say, for example, when you study general relativity. So, uh, so you know, working in coordinates is, is very good for some people, for other people. Well, this is a question also of cases. Some people hate it, some people love it. But I'm going to, I want to be able also to work on coordinates. So I will denote by EA a basis of sections an orthonormal, orthonormal ver, uh, basis of sections. E. 
Okay, so, oops. So A goes from one to N now. Uh, well, actually to, to M, sorry. Um, in a, so this is, uh, this is in a local trivialization of the one, okay? So you cannot do this globally, of course, otherwise the bundle will be trivial, but locally you can always define an orthonormal basis of section. So this means that G of E A E B is equal to the T, okay? Now, for those of you who are familiar maybe with general relativity, this is what is called usually a Virvain or an uh, in, 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 in general relativity. Okay. Now, uh, now when when you work on, on when you work on on local coordinates, uh, on, when you work on coordinates and when you work with respect to an orthonormal basis of sections, you actually can reduce the connection to a matrix. Huh? So, so uh, the connection acting on, uh, on EA has to be, in, in this local tradition, has to be a linear combination of, uh, of, the set of, of, of the basis itself. And this defines a matrix TBA, EB. So here, uh, I assume, as I did very often, Einstein's convention, so repeated indices are sum. So here I'm summing over the B index. So if so, this this defines so this defines the connection matrix. Which of course is a one form, no? because remember that well, I already this already disappeared, but this is uh, this is a matrix of one forms because remember that delta goes from gamma e to gamma e. Which uh, tensor product sorry with T M, so T A B is actually T A B me sorry T A B uh, mu up oh, T A B mu D X me okay again in a local trivialization okay so. Working in coordinates means that you work uh, in a local trivialization for both the bundle and the manifold. Okay. Now, uh, since I have a basis, I can expand any 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 section. I can write it as a as a linear combination, where now is A's are functions in this uh, local uh, open set where I trivialize. So, so here uh, my trivialization. Uh, means that I'm working on a subset of on, on U, or U of M, in which uh, E is uh, is a is trivialized as a product, mm -hmm. and then I have here functions, and then uh, I can define a covariant derivative of these functions, which is just D of S A. So this is the standard differential plus T A B S B. Okay. So. So this is the this this is is sometimes called the covariant derivative. Okay, so this just follows from this definition plus the Leibniz. This follows from this definition of the connection matrix plus uh, the Leibniz rule. Okay, so but this is a definition. Eh? This is a, a natural definition of this. And finally. The curvature of the connection I'm going to define it uh, through the connection matrix. So I'm going to call it K is D theta plus theta with theta. So it's a matrix and a two form. And here I assume the standard you know, multiplication of matrix. So if you want K A B is delta of theta A B plus theta A C wedge theta C B. Okay, so this is the formula for the for the connection. Okay. 
So these are all the data that I'm going to use. Um, now you can extend the, you know the, so the, all these all, all these are are, are, are are local definitions for coordinates. Okay. And now I'm going to define. So now what is churn by theory says? I'm not going to develop churn by theory in detail. I'm only going to to remind you what are the main statements of, of churn by theory because we are going to actually rederive churn cell by churn by theory by using the supersymmetric uh, formalism. Now churn by theory tells you that out of the curvature you can actually construct a particular representative of the tongue of, of the of the of the Euler class. So remember that what we want to calculate eventually it's a differential form which is closed by not not exact, so that it gives me the representative of the Euler class. So this is the Euler class. <clears throat> and term by theory tells me that I can do that if I choose a connection on my bundle, I can calculate a representative of this. And this is actually, remember that, uh, let me remind you something is that uh, uh, I, I forgot to say that uh, TAB is an anti symmetric matrix. So, and this is because uh, I'm assuming that, uh, no, th this you can deduce from the, from the definition of, uh, from the definition of the compatibility of the connection and the, and the metric, huh? but it's just uh, the fact that, uh, so if, if you want uh, another way of saying this is that the structural group here, the structural group of the bundle here is SO2M, and the Lie algebra of SO2M are anti-symmetric matrices. So all these matrices are anti-symmetric, and K is also anti-symmetric. So you can actually uh, compute the Fafian. Remember that we introduced this beautiful audio, which is the Fafian of the matrix. And it turns out that the Fafian of the curvature matrix gives you a representative of the, um, of the curvature. Okay, um, now this defines, so this defines, first of all, this defines a, uh, a, uh, sorry, I mean, I don't know what happens here, but uh, this is definitely still not uh, something I can master. So this defines a global differential form on the magnifier. Uh, why is this so? Well, remember that K was defined in each uh, trivialization uh, open set. So K was defined patch by patch. So K was defined patch by patch, but so you have two patches here, U1 and U2, here there will be a representative of the method of the, there will be a curvature K1 for this patch and a curvature K2 on this patch. So what happens in the intersection? Well, you can see that the intersection K1 is going to be related to K2, well, I, I use G also for the for the metric, so let me change notation. So I'm going to call it H maybe. It's going to be related by invertible metrics like this. So the Fafian uh, will be invariant under this transformation. So so in, in the intersection of patches, K1 and K2 are related in this way, but the Fafian for K1 is going to be equal to the Fafian of K2. Okay. So, uh, so in this sense, uh, you know, you can start with the local, uh, with uh, this uh, differential form, which is defined locally, and the Fafian defines a global differential form, okay? 
So, so this is fine, but, uh, but uh, there is no reason why uh, this, uh, 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 you know, there is no reason why this differential form dif is actually uh, defining the Euler class. In particular, it's not obvious why the Euler class, which is definitely shouldn't depend on the metric uh, that you choose, uh, why you know, this construction is, 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 is giving you something which is independent of the metric, right? I mean, it's clear that the Euler class of the bundle is a topological information, you know, it hasn't, doesn't have anything to do with the metric. So how, can, how, can, how is it possible that we can use the metric to define such a Euler class, okay? So that, 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 and, and this is precisely the point that we were mentioning at the very beginning. Uh, we want to be able to obtain topological information by using something which is not topological. Okay, so how does it this? How is this possible? And what the, this what makes this possible is cohomology, the fact that we are not interested in a differential form, but we're interested in a class of differential form. Okay, which is the cohomology class. So it turns out that. Also, the representative of this other class depends on the metric. The, homo the cohomology class that this defines does not depend on the metric or, or in the connection. Okay, when I mean metric, I mean metric plus connection. Okay, so one thing that you prove in 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 in, in turn by theory is that if you have two uh, different choices of the metric, so you know if you take of uh, the connection, sorry. Uh, this is, I talk about metric because uh, when you use the cotanian band, there is a unique connection compatible with the metric, which is the levi chivita connection. I mean, this one connection, which is a special connection, which is the levi chivita connection, and this is associated to the metric. But in general, the only thing you need here are two different uh, connections which are compatible with the given metric. So imagine that you have two such connections. Now it turns out that, you know, you will have two different objects here. You will have E uh, of Nabla, and you will have also E of Nabla Twiddle of E. So these are two different objects. So if this is, if this represents the Euler class, these two different objects cannot be arbitrary. And it turns out that the main statement of churn by the theory is that the difference of these two objects is the exact, is D of something. So if these two things are different, but they differ in an exact differential form, they define the same cohomology class. So at the level of cohomology classes, E is equal to E twiddle of D, e, and as cohomology classes are equal, okay? So this is how churn by theory makes uh, the remarkable uh, uh, achievement of uh, producing a topological invariant by using non-topological information. And the reason is that uh, when you change the non-topological information, what you get is something which is trivial in cohomology. And again, you know, this should remind you what we did in supersymmetric theories when we were studying the partition function. So remember that the partition function, Z, that we defined before, so this is similar to what happened before. So what we did before was, we defined this partition function uh, that depend, dependent on H, but what we saw is that the dependence on H was very mild in the sense that if you change H, uh, what happens is that the integrand of this uh, partition function changes in something which was delta exact, and then this wouldn't change the theory, okay? This wouldn't change the partition function. So this is the same, uh, the same uh, principle here. So we define something that depends on the connection, but if you change the connection, this object changes, but in a exact differential, huh? in, a, in, in, a, in a D uh, exact object. And then, you know, at the, at the level of cohomology classes, they do not, uh, this doesn't change. And in particular, in particular, notice that uh, 
if 2m is equal to n, if the dimension of the manifold is equal to the m, then the integral of these objects are the same. Okay. Precisely because they differ in uh, the exact quantity. So this is exactly this is exactly the kind of uh, the kind of principle that we used before. Okay. So so this is how uh, term by theory works. Okay. And so 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 we use a connection plus a metric. Which are not topological to define a topological environment. Uh, I think, of course, you have done this. I mean, uh, I think you have done this probably when you studied um, the theory of, of, of this goes back to the work of, of Gauss and. and uh, and, and company on on the differential geometry of, of surfaces. I mean, uh, one of the I think one of the main resources that you may be studied in the theory of surfaces is that uh, the um, you can define this curvature of a surface, and and then you know the integral of this curvature gives you uh, the the Euler characteristic of the surface and the, and its invariant. Okay, this is really a topological invariant. So this is this is this this kind of very general version of of, of this statement. Okay, so are there questions so far about this? I mean, I get that many of you are not maybe so far with geometry and so on, but uh, I mean, if you have questions, maybe we can try to make it clearer. No, no questions. Okay, again, this is a review of term by theory for those of you, who, I mean, I, I didn't prove this, I didn't prove this statement, okay? So I didn't prove this statement, but in a sense, we are going to, we are going to give a sort of proof of a more general statement, okay? So if you are not familiar with this, uh, don't worry because this is just a motivation and we will eventually uh, prove something even more general, okay? So now the other root, the other root topological invariance oh. is Poincaré. So in Poincaré Hoff theory, uh, what you do is you define, you consider a section of the bundle E, okay? And it turns out that uh, you can extract the Euler number of, of well, the Euler class, huh? by looking at the zeros of this thing so 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 the zeros of this thing this defines a zero locus of s and then e epsilon is the dual in x of the homology of of this uh, of excess. Okay, so again, if you are not familiar with all this geometry, do not worry. There is a simpler version of this, which is simpler again. You know, which this happens when n is equal to two m, and then uh, poincare hopf theory again, and, and and using this just as a motivation. This is something that we will redefine. Okay, so this is just a motivation for those of you who are familiar with this. Otherwise. You know, just wait and we'll really redirect everything. Uh, in Poincare Hoff theory, you actually show that you can compute the Euler characteristic of E as a sum over the zeros of this section. So now, when 
when 2m is equal to n, the zero locus of this section turns out to be one dimensional generically, sorry, zero dimensional generically. So these are points, okay? And this is just because, you know, you have as many equations of, as variables, right? If you, have, if you have a section of a vector bundle whose dimension is the same as the dimension of the manifold, and you want a zero of this section, then you will have uh, n equations for n variables, and then the, generically the solution will be points, okay? So in this case, S m minus of zero is just a set of points, okay? And then the Euler characteristic of this, of this uh, vector bundle can be uh, obtained by summing over these points a set of numbers which are always plus or minus one. Hmm? And the, now, I mean, uh, I will define, I will, more, uh, I will be more precise later on on how you compute this number associated to these zeros. But this should already remind you what we did precisely again in the computation of Z. The computation of Z, we have this function H and our final formula for the partition function was a, a, a formula which was very, very similar to this one, okay? And so in a sense, what we were doing with this, um, uh, function uh, uh, with this function um, partition function was uh, a toy model of this Poincaré Hopf uh, result. Okay. Now again, uh, the main point of Poincaré Hopf theory is to show that uh, mm, that uh, this quantity do, does not depend on the choice of section. So you see, uh, different sections would give me different uh, zero locus, zero loci, okay? If I have here two sections, so you have another section T, I will get another, a completely different set of fixed points. But the main point of poincare hopf theory is that if I choose another section T, the sum of over fixed point of over the zero locus of this section of this plus minus one is going to be the same. So I can deform my section and still I will get the same result. So again, this is another way in which you try to extract topological information from non-topological information. So this information is not, I mean, the section is not an invariant property of the bundle. Huh? It depends on your, uh, it's just a, a completely non-topological choice. But the point of poincare hopf is that you can extract topological information out of this non-topological thing by doing some specific type of calculation, okay? So this is exactly the same principle that we were using in the context of uh, churn by theory, okay? So these are the two, uh, these are the two uh, main ways in which uh, you can approach this problem of extracting topological information about a bundle on a manifold. And, and now what we are going to do is to, uh, to, to introduce, uh, to reformulate all this with supersymmetric field, uh, uh, with a supersymmetric quantum field theory in zero dimensions. Now, now, don't be confused here, because uh, I'm telling you, uh, I'm now talking about ma a manifold in n dimensions, and I'm telling you that I'm going to reformulate this using quantum theory in zero dimensions. So, you know, you could think that I'm making a contradiction here because, you're, you know, you know uh, I'm talking about manifolds of n dimensions, I'm talking about quantum theory in zero dimensions, how is this possible? Well, this is possible because in quantum field theory, you have to be very careful about what you mean by dimension, okay? So when I mean zero dimensions, I mean that my functions, my, my variables X, do not depend on anything, okay? Do not depend on time, do not depend on anything else. But these X themselves can become coordinates, okay? I can have these Xs as coordinates of a manifold, okay? So, my x's, which do not depend on anything, both could build up the, the local coordinates of a given manifold. So this is uh, so this is uh, uh, so so this is more generally in quantum theory you have to distinguish the dimension 
of the uh, of the uh, of the quantum field theory and uh, the dimension oh i don't know why this is happening all the time the dimension of the target some what you can call sometimes the dimension of the i mean So this means the dimension of the manifold where the fields themselves live. Uh, so in my theory in zero dimensions, I, have, I will have coordinates xi, and these coordinates xi will be local coordinates of a manifold. But these coordinates themselves do not depend on anything else. So we are in zero dimensions, and it's the target of the theory uh, what, which lives in, in, in whatever dimension we want. Okay, so that's, that's a clarification which is important. So, we are going to then reformulate all this with supersymmetric quantum field here in a zero dimensions. And we are going to actually, uh, we are what, what, uh, and this will allow us, this will allow us, <sighs> to prove invariance. under uh, invariance under changes of connection and under changes of section. Okay. So, and in particular, will be will unify will unify Chernobyl and Poincaré Hof. So we are going to construct. We are going to construct a representative of the Chern class. Sorry, of the Chern class of the of the of the of the Euler class which uh, depends on both a section and a connection, okay? And this actually, uh, so in such a way that when S is equal to zero, this E zero of gamma is the term by representative, okay? And this representative, which reduces to the term by representative and depends also on a section, is called the Mathai Quillen class. So this is a very important object. Uh, it's a purely geometric construction. So Mathai and Quillen are mathematicians who actually introduced this uh, representative. Um, but this is a very beautiful construction because it unifies these two approaches to calculating Euler classes of van der Sar, mm? The one that, dep that uh, it's depending on a connection and one which is dependent on a section. And what we're going to do is to introduce, uh, the, to define the math equivalent class using a supersymmetric theory. And once you have this supersymmetric theory, we'll be able to show the invariance under changes of S and, and the connection NABLA by using the techniques that we use to, the, uh, to prove the invariance of Z under the formations of the function H. Okay. And in a sense, uh, once we do this, then the route to topological field theories of the Witten type will be almost established because uh, every, well, not every, but I guess almost all interesting topological field theories of the Witten type can be formulated in terms of generalizations of this math equivalent formalism. So once I introduce this math equivalent formalism, and I, 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 I want to warn you that this is maybe already much more difficult than what we did until now. This is maybe one of the most difficult parts of this course. But once you understand this, you can essentially already start uh, working on topological field theory of the cohomological type because it's all going to be a generalization of it, okay? 
But um, strictly speaking, mm, the Mathai Quillen class is a construction in, turn, in, in the context of, of the theory of topological invariance of vector bundles, which we are going to just to reformulate using this language of, of, of supersymmetric theory. Okay? Uh, and the first step in this reformulation, this is something that we'll do after, after, the, after Easter, but uh, remember that uh, the term by the representative was written in terms of the Fafian of K, and we know that the Fafian can be written by using Grassmann variables, right? So we can always write uh, the Fafian as some exponential of one half of k a k a b k b so we can introduce grassman oops we can introduce grassman variables k a where a goes from one to to two m okay and uh the function can be written in this form so already churned by theory, which involves the Fafian in a crucial way, will be uh, will be able to I mean, we will be able to write it in terms of a theory involving Grassmann variables. Um, this will pave the way to introducing our supersymmetric uh, quantum field theory in zero dimensions. Okay, so the, my Grassmann variables here will be some sort of auxiliary Grassmann variables to implement the fact that we have a Fafian. Okay. Also, eventually, we will be, you know, this will, we'll think about these variables, Grassmann variables as variables in a super space accompanying the coordinates of the, of the bundle, okay? Okay, very good. Uh, so, I think it's time to stop. Are there questions here? Uh, Marcos, I actually have a question. Yes. Uh, can you introduce some references to this topic, like uh, this uh, quantum mechanics, supersymmetric quantum mechanics approach to this topic? Is there any reference? Uh, which, uh, I mean, for, for which topic? For this one, for this Mathai Quillen story? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Now, if you want to, to read about the Mathai Quillen, um, about the Mathai Quillen formalism, uh, there are three references that I can give you. One is by Blau and Thompson. Uh, I will eventually I will give you the polycopier with this uh, with the course, and in the course in the polycopier there will be more reference. Okay. Okay. But, okay. But Blau and Thompson. Anybody can tell me why uh, the 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 iPad keeps going up when I'm just writing on it. Anyway, so there is a paper called Localization and Diagonalization. By Blau and Thompson, where this is explained. So there is an introduction to this math equivalent formalism. Now, uh, there is a very complete uh, re uh, lectures by Cordes, Moon, Moore, and Ram Gulam. Lectures on topological field theory. Okay. And there is also my book with La Bastida called uh, Topological Quantum Field Theory and Four Manifolds, where there is also a chapter on this formalism, and this is what I'm more or less sub following. And um, for those of you who would like to remind, the, I mean, everything, I mean, I, I have you, maybe what is, has been a little bit harder uh, so far is all the mathematical aspect of this. I mean, I have introduced, you know, bundles, connections, uh, curvature, turn by theory, Poincare Hoff, and all this, you name it. So for those of you who want to kind of ref refresh or have a look at, at, at all this geometry, uh, uh, I can only uh, recommend the, the, the famous, uh, Report gravitation and gauge theory by uh, Eguchi. I, oops. I think this is Eguchi, Gilkey, and Hanson. This is a physics report. 
but it's an old reference, but this is still uh, a really amazing reference of on, on the the geometry that you need to 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 to, to do. I mean, the, the, all the geometric constructions which are involved in gravitational this is This is really, this would be mandatory reading for all physicists that uh, work on these topics. I assume that most mathematicians should know about this from more, uh, from more, uh, you know, established reference in math. I mean, you know, there are many books on, you know, for example, if you want to have like a, like a more mathematical books on, on, on these stories, there is, of course, the book by, uh, the book by Bot Cantu. Uh, I, uh, I mean, I don't remember the title, something like differential forms on, on manifolds or something like this. But this is a famous geometry book where you can find these things. But the, the reports on the, the physical reports on by Eguchi Gitian has on gravitation and gauge theory. Uh, and uh, it's something called something like gravitation gauge theory and differential geometry, something like that. It's really, it's, it's really an excellent reference, and the mathematics in this book is completely, perfectly rigorous and, and complete. Okay, so here you will find chern theory, connections on bundles, everything you name it. Okay, it has everything you need. Okay, so so these are the references, but um, I don't know if this is enough, or you want something else? Well, thanks already. It's already a lot. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, if you don't understand something, I mean, if you don't, you know, this course is complicated because I have to mix uh, both math and physics. So I'm sure that many, many mathematicians have been lost with some of the physics and many physicists have been a little bit lost with some of the mathematics. So this is part of the game. You have to know both things. Uh, now, for for those of you who are, uh, I mean, if, if you have studied, the, you know, General relativity, everything I have introduced, connections and band, uh, curvature and so on, this, this is essentially a standard in, in general relativity. I mean, for mathematicians who have not studied this, you know, well, they should have done it. Um, you know, they, this is basic uh, differential geometry of vector bundles. So, but, you know, maybe if they have not uh, studied this, uh, well, uh, and they want to to understand it better, you know, they will have to read either Botan 2 or Kobayashi no Mitsuku or, you know, any of the references on differential geometry of bundles, okay? So if, if you need a specific, uh, if specific references, you just ask me. But what is, what is, uh, maybe what is more reassuring is that you shouldn't worry if you don't know all the details of the, um, all the, all the details about churn by theory and so on, you, it's, it's not really needed. This is not the goal of the course. The goal of this course is not to do churn by theory. I mean, otherwise the course would be called, uh, you know, differential geometry of bundles, you know. This is not a course on differential geometry of bundles, okay? This is a course on introduction to topological field theory. So what we are going to do is to reformulate uh, some of these things using the language of quantum field theory. So even if you don't know these things, you will get an understanding of it maybe not in a standard language, but you will eventually understand it. Okay? So not maybe at the most rigorous level, but uh, if you didn't know churn by theory, by the end of, 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 of the next week course, you should uh, feel comfortable with churn by theory, okay? Any other comment, question? Okay, so I guess we'll see each other after the Easter break. So feel free also to send me emails with questions. Um, and I will, uh, uh, when I, once I'm done with this, uh, I mean, I, I will probably put the polycopy of this part already uh, during the Easter break uh, in, in Moodle. So if you, if you want to have a look at it before even I finish the, 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 the course you can, you will be able to do it. Okay. Okay, bye.